All right, pages 7 through 9. And page 7 is a continuation of Starvation in the Midst of Plenty, the title of page 6. All right, so during the Depression, the economic depression, unions tried to protect members and their families. Using strikes to protest, layoffs and wage cuts, they also urged the government to create public employment programs. But owners used blacklists, lockouts, and the police to crush labor. Remember that, the uh, video post. On the eve of the Great Strike, mine operators smashed the miners' union by linking it to several brutal, brutal murders carried out by a secret Irish organization called the Molly Maguires. Nationwide, total union membership fell from 300,000 in 1870 to 50,000 in 1876. So, so the owners were successful in the public arena of branding the, these workers and their worker activity as these dangerous radicals out to destroy Americanism. So membership in the railroad unions also plummeted. After growing in the 1860s, they suffered major defeats in 1873 and 1874, right at the beginning of the, that depression. The Brotherhood of Engineers won minor victories, but did not represent most railroad workers. By 1877, no railroad union, including the new trainsmen union, could effectively oppose the railroad owners. The Grand Army of Starvation, as they were called. So the Great Strike of 1877, page 8, was largely spontaneous. It was what you would call a wildcat strike. It wasn't planned by union leadership. It was the workers themselves just walking out. The Great Strike of 1877 was largely spontaneous and without national organization. Unions played a minor part in the upheaval. Backed against the wall by wage cuts and increased workloads, railroad workers stood up for what they felt was their rights as Americans and in doing so, set off a nationwide chain reaction. So they were going for more workplace democracy in their minds, in addition to their, uh, their specific demands. The strike was supported by diverse groups in large cities such as Chicago and Pittsburgh. Immigrants, African Americans, and other men and women hurt by the Depression denounced the privileges of wealthy residents. In smaller towns, where the free labor ideal still flourished, Workers, farmers, small shop owners, and even local sheriffs sympathized with worker struggle and came out to protest against the giant railroads. So in places like that, there was more solidarity, even between gender and race. The violence of the strike was shocking, even by Gilded Age standards. Remember, the Gilded Age was like 1880s, 1890s. Many contemporaries and some later historians blamed the violence on, quote, the senseless savagery of the mob. That's what you saw in the newspapers. However, nearly all crowd violence occurred in response to police or militia attacks against strikers. And once aroused, the crowd was not unthinking. Crowd activity had specific targets. The militia, which was usually sent from other localities, so they would not feel a sense of solidarity with the workers. The target would be the property of railroads and other big corporations and local symbols of wealth and privilege. Once the strike was underway, the Socialist Working Men's Party of the, of the United States, WPUS, tried to direct it. They were most successful in St. Louis, where a nonviolent interracial general strike shut down factories citywide. But neither the WPUS nor any union could link local strikes together into one unified nationwide uprising. Like I said, it was more a wildcat. Railroad owners called the strikers un-American and linked liberty to property rights. Many newspaper editors joined the attack. The National Republican blamed the strike on, quote, communism, a poison introduced into our social system by European laborers. Remember, Karl Marx had written his stuff by this point. Some editors recalled the, quote, the Paris Commune of 1871, when the workers of Paris led a citywide revolt and set up a new government. Yet strikers thought they were defending America's heritage of equality and independence. Right. Those, those accusations accusations weren't true. They were just trying to win the PR battle. Yet strikers thought they were defending America's heritage of equality and independence, pointing to government funding for railroad construction. They claimed owners had betrayed the nation's trust for the sake of higher profits. Cap capital has overridden the Constitution, said one St. Louis working man. Quote, capital has changed liberty into serfdom and we must fight or die. So they looked at their loss of freedom, their loss of standard of living, and how much financial assistance 
railroad owners had gotten from the U.S. government in the form of tax breaks um, and land grants. Railroad owners called for the U.S. Army to suppress the strike, but they had a hard time winning over Republican President Rutherford B. Hayes, a Civil War hero. Though friendly with railroad owners, Hayes knew his party had long depended on working men's votes. Furthermore, since revolutionary times, Americans had seen strong government and a standing army as threats to the rights of free citizens. Many Americans had criticized the growth of the federal government during the Civil War. How would they react now if the army was now used against them, against working people? Finally, Hayes did take action. For the first time in American history, the army was used to break a strike. Hayes' action not only sealed the fate of the strike, but set a precedent for future industrial disputes. And here's the precedent. Federal troops and court injunctions, like orders by a judge, became powerful weapons for employers. It really wasn't until World War I that the government began coming down on the side of workers, and that was to get try to get workers to stop going on strike so much during the war. All right. Um, all right. That was pages seven through nine. That's what I was supposed to do, right? Yep. Seven through nine.